Okay, we're looking at the basic structure of an ATP molecule. And over here we can see we have our nitrogen base. We've got some adenine over here. And down here we've got ribose. And of course over here we have our T is in triphosphate. We've got three phosphate groups. So one, two, three. And this is a simple structure, but I'm pointing it out for a few reasons. First of all, you notice this is adenine, which is also something that shows up in a certain molecule that you should be very familiar with. We've got ribose, and if you imagine ribose with a phosphate group and a nitrogen base, you essentially have a nucleotide for making a strand of RNA. It's not too hard to imagine some uracil over here binding with the adenine, so uracil, and then of course another ribose, another phosphate group. And if you just keep piling these up to Lee, you'll have a string of RNA. It's also not hard to point out or to imagine taking away one of the oxygens from the ribose and turning it into deoxyribose, in which case you'd have essentially a base pair for DNA. The reason I'm pointing it out is that it's really interesting the way that even though we've got so many different life forms in this world, so much diversity and so many different processes that, that life carries out and so many different adaptations, a lot of it can, comes back down to being driven by some basic chemical groups and chemical reactions. In this case, the structure that looks suspiciously similar to the, to the structure that life uses to store genetic information, and here it's being used to store energy. So that's just something to imagine. Now we've got the hydrolysis of ATP, which is what we're going to talk about. So hydrolysis. Now when you lyse something, that means you break it down. So essentially the lysis is separating one of these phosphate groups. And you can think of lysosomes or hydrolysis. When you analyze something, you're breaking down the ideas. So this lysing basically means to break something up or separate it. We've got lysosomes that break down enzymes. And so we've got a phosphate group. I won't write the whole structure. We'll just call this P. I like that to show that it's inorganic phosphate, so it's got an I. And this can be used, well, when this, when this phosphate group is taken away from the ATP, now we end up with ADP, adenosine diphosphate, because we've lost a phosphate group. And this whole process is exergonic, that means it gives off energy, so the delta G, the change in free energy, is actually negative 7 kilocalories per mole. And what that means is that this molecule is going to lose seven kilocalories of energy and that energy can be used to put things to work so energy energy seven kilocalories per mole so there are three basic ways this energy is used in a cell the first way is um, this phosphate group binds with another chemical and that can cause the chemical to become less stable so that it's more likely to react and so essentially it causes a chemical reaction to take place. When the phosphate binds, it creates what's called a phosphorylated intermediate. And I'll give you an example of a phosphorylated intermediate. But we've got glutamic acid, and normally glutamic acid needs to bind with ammonia, ammonia to create glutamine. But this reaction requires energy. So what happens is the phosphate groups gl group binds with the glutamic acid, and that allows it to bond with NH. Essentially, it allows it to bond with NH2. And of course, so we'll let ATP in here. So ATP plus the glutamic acid and the phosphate group allows it to bond with NH2, and it leads to glutamine plus ADP. The delta G is actually three and a half kilocalories per mole. And so this process absorbs energy. And where did it get the energy from? It got the energy from lysing the ATP and creating ADP. Another more interesting process involves proteins. Now when this phosphate group, this free phosphate, binds with a protein, it can cause that protein to change shape temporarily and then it will snap back to its original shape. But one way we can use this is if you imagine a microtubule in a cell and we've got a motor protein which generally is shaped like two feet that bind to the cell. So 
a motor protein. And this motor protein can be attached to a vesicle carrying something. This could be carrying other proteins, other cellular products, some metabolites. But the ATP binds with this protein, and as a result, well actually the ATP reacts with the protein, releases the phosphate group. The phosphate group binds with the protein and causes one of these feet to move forward. And so if you can imagine this reaction repeating several times with several ATPs, and these two feet slowly take steps forward and step by step by step they walk along the microtubule carrying this vesicle to another place. Another thing that proteins can do is if we've got a cell membrane here and we've got a special kind of protein here called the transport protein. So some kind of molecule goes into this transport protein the ATP causes the protein to change shape so that it closes up, these two jaws close, and they reopen on the outside of the cell, releasing this same molecule out here. And so essentially this allows active transport. And so the ATP causes this protein to contract, change its shape, and then reopen, transporting things across a membrane. Now transporting items across a membrane is very critical to a lot of processes involved with um, photosynthesis, with respiration. This happens a lot inside of the mitochondria. So just remember for this, ATP plus water, H2O, causes the, pro causes the ATP to lyse so that you have ADP, adenosine diphosphate, plus a phosphate group, plus energy. Well, and this is how ATP works in carrying out all the different activities that ATP powers inside of a cell.